And I've titled this message, God Expects Your Best. All right? And that kind of goes without saying. I mean, of course, God expects our best. And, and I would think that you would have that, that thought, right, running through your mind a little bit somewhere when we come to worship. If you remember from last week or if you're, if you're new to us this morning, Malachi is, a, um, is the last book of the Old Testament. And it focuses on really the condition right? They are the saints, they are the Israelites, they're kind of just going through the motions of their worship. Their worship is just, um, you know, we're here, we're doing it. It's a religion of routine, right? They're just, this is what we're expected to do. And so they have all these questions. You know, God has come down at the beginning of the first five verses, and they say, you know, I have loved you, and yet you say, how have you loved me? And God does something, I think, which is really kind of, I mean, he's God, and so, of course, it's awesome, right? Uh, he points them to Scripture, right? And he uses his name, I am the self-existent one, right? He uses these titles in the name of who he is. I am, right? He is the sovereign God. He is the God who has loved you, past tense. He is the God of justice. He guides us daily, right? He leads us. He shows us in Scripture things we should not do, things we should be doing, things that he delights in, right? So he currently loves us, and of course, he is faithful, we sing of his faithfulness this morning. We think about the cross, and we see this, right? And God, it's who God is. God's answer to that question is, I am God, right? I mean, can, he's the only one that can say that. Everyone, everyone else, I don't think we have anything on that, right? But he's God, and so he answers those questions, and he's kind of breaking or snapping this, this, the Israelites out of their, their drone thinking, right? Everything's become a, a drudgery. We're just, we're here. I don't know why God's upset at us. You know, I'm, come on. And, and, you know, as we get into this, because the passage today, really, it focuses on the priests and what the priests were doing. And they're guilty, I mean, immensely. And yet they have these, this, this heart issue or this, where they just say, how am I guilty? What have I done, right? Show me where I'm wrong. Where have I defiled this? And they have these just questions. And God keeps exposing it and exposing it and exposing it. You know, as I was going and reading through this passage, I kind of, I, I reshaped my points many times. I thought, we'll say it this way. Well, no, that's not right. We'll say it this way. And, um, because we're a New Testament church, right? We want to learn from this, and we want to apply in the light of, of the cross of Jesus Christ. What does God expect of us? You know, what does he desire of his children? I believe God ex still expects, right, the best of our worship we should come and give. And I realize that that, at times, sometimes our worship is broken. Sometimes it's full of of hurts, and sometimes we just we go through difficulties, and that's hard to come, right? But God it still expects us to come, doesn't He? To come and be faithful, and so we're talking about in general terms in that sense, come, right? You know, as I was thinking about this passage and, and the idea that you know God has a standard, God God's standard is perfection, right? That's that's His standard. That's what the law reveals. And unless you're perfect, right, you can't get into heaven. That's, he doesn't lower it and say, you guys look good. I'll let you in. You guys, sorry, tough luck, the, the standard. He doesn't lower that bar. And we have Christ, right, who, who, who's taken that for us. And because of Christ, we receive his perfect righteousness, and we are saved. Right? We don't, we don't, we don't doesn't make us righteous. We have his righteousness. And so therefore, as, as a New Testament church, as we come here today, we realize that we live, right? Hopefully you understand that we, we should be living for something greater. Jesus told us to go, make disciples, go, teach them what I've, I've, I've told you to observe, right? Observe all that I've commanded. And so we have this, this, this drive, at least it should be in us. But often, because we live in this world and we, we're, our schedules are so crazy, if your calendar looks like mine, yeah, you're, you're just, it's just full, right? All the time. Here's where I'm doing this, 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 this. And sometimes in our walk with the Lord, he gets he gets pushed to the side, doesn't he? And see, what's, what's so amazing in this passage is I, I think there's, there's profound parallels to the church today, right, that, that parallels what's happening in Malachi's day. They're going through the motions. Remember, they, they, they are, this is post-captivity. Uh, they're back in the land. They're, they're you know, building the wall in the, day of ne uh, the days of Nehemiah, and this is kind of what's happening. They are performing sacrifices, and in essence, there's, there's no real meaning behind it. They're just going through the motions. They're not living for something better, something bigger. See, their standard has been lowered, right? They're, they're operating on their standard. This is what is good enough. This meets the need for God. Just show up right? Sometimes it feels like that. We just show up. You know, as, as I was thinking about this and reading through this passage, I was thinking about the movie Miracle, which is about the 1984 U.S. hockey team. And if you're familiar with the movie or, or, or you know, what they had to do, they took these college kids and they went and got the gold medal, right? But before they could get it to the gold medal, he, 
He had to play the Russians. And there's this, this scene that happens before all this when they're kind of together. And, you know, he would continue to ask. The coach would ask the players, you know, who, do you play, who are you and, and who do you play for? And they would always say their name. And they always reference the, the university they played hockey for. And then there's this, this moment where they're at this, this before the Olympics start, and they're playing some, some team, I don't re- recall which, and, and he notices, the coach notices that the, the, these college kids are more interested in what's happening in the stands than, than what's happening on the, the rink. And so this quite upsets him, right? And so naturally after the game, and I don't, know if, I don't recall if they won or tied or something, they tied or something, he, he has them stay on the ice. And I don't know if you've ever played sports, high school, college, or whatever. I, I think there's coaches out there that, um, are sometimes really mean, right? And so you have this scene where he's having them skate back and forth, right? If you've ever played soccer, you know what that's about. If you've ever done anything in sports whatsoever, hear the whistle, run to the line, skate to the line, swim to the line, whatever it is, and, and skate back, wait for the whistle, keep going again, right? Well, they do. He does this so, so long that, uh, at the course, everyone in the stands has left, and um, they want to close the place, and he tells them, you know, leave the keys all locked up, the lights are shut off, and he's still skating these, these college kids. And, you know, they're to the point of throwing up and all this. And, and finally, one of the kids yells out his name, right? And he asks him, who do you play for? And the kid responds, I play for the United States of America. And it's at that moment where he says, that'll be all boys, and he walks off the ice, right? And it's this, this hard teaching lesson that there, there's a higher standard, right? You're not playing for yourself, right? You're playing for something greater. You're playing for something bigger. And see, when you step into Malachi's day, what are these priests doing? They're, they're playing for themselves. It's just what I think is the standard. This is what I feel that should meet God's need. I don't know why he has all these questions. I don't know why he comes and says we're defiling things. I don't know why he comes and says he hasn't loved us. Why? I don't get it, right? And that's where they're at because they have lowered God's standard so much, right, that even in the passage we'll read here in a moment, they sneer at it, right? It's a nuisance to them. I can't believe it. this showing up is just like, come on. I should get credit for being here, right? Come on. And so, so much the parallel with, with today's church, right? We see some parallels. We see things happening. I'm just talking about in general sense, right? But we should learn from this. And I believe the, the insights I think the, the Lord is giving us will, be, will help us get on the right direction if we're not there already. So here's Malachi, chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. I'm going to read through the end of the chapter through verse 14. It says, A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then, if then I am the Father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts? To you priests who despise my name, yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? You offer defiled food on my altar, but say, in what way have we defiled you? By saying the table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? But now entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us while this is being done by your hands. Will he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? Who is there even among you who would shut the doors so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hands. For from the rising of the sun even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place incense shall be offered to my name, and a pure offering for my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it, in that you say, The table of the Lord is defiled, and its fruit, its food, is contemptible. You also say, Oh, what a weariness, and you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you being, excuse me, and you bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick, thus you bring an offering. Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord? But cursed be the deceiver who has in his flock a male and takes a vow, but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. I pray this morning, Lord, that your spirit would enlighten it for us, 
that you would give us insights, help us to understand, Lord, to know and to grow. And I pray, Lord, as always, uh, get me out of the way that all attention and focus would be placed upon you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I said earlier, it's, it's quite interesting that God's answer, the first question, the first five verses is, you know, how have you loved us? And God's answer is, is in essence, scripture, right? Doctrine, theology. He says, points them, look, you should know. And he points to the Bible and he references who he is, right? That's, that's the answer of knowing who God is. And it's interesting that the priests here who are posing the questions in the passage we just read are the ones who are guilty of not actually looking to the scriptures, right? They should know better. They are not looking to the scriptures to figure this whole thing out, what they should be doing, how the sacrifices should be done, and what does God require. So it's quite interesting that we see this parallel, right? Once is God saying, good, look, go turn to the Bible, right? We should have a, a desire for the Bible. We should be reading the Bible. That should be something in your life that is happening, right? Because we see so much error in our society and so much error, unfortunately, in the church, right, can happen. And we see in this passage, right, the priests who should know better, right, are not doing what they should be doing. But what's important is the whole, right, of, of the nation of Israel, they all are suffering because of this. And the passage goes on, so it focuses on the priests at the beginning, but then it, it kind of develops and it widens and it kind of, in essence, brings everyone. Everyone is guilty, right, because they're following after what the priests are doing. Here's the standard that just keeps getting lowered, right? And you think there's some, some wonderful insight for us, and I kind of put my my three points for us this morning, I put them in a, in a positive way. I try to say, here's what we should do. We're a New Testament church. We know God has loved us. We can turn to the scriptures. And so I think these are things that we want to see happen uh, in us, right? It should be happening in us. It should be happening in your pastor. They should be happening in your leaders. They should be happening in those who teach, right? It should be happening in God's church. And my first point here is uh, when we demonstrate giving God our best because he expects it, we, we can demonstrate this by uh, when we re revere his name is what I put, yeah? When we revere his name, right? Verses 6 through 8, it just simply says, right, this, these, these questions and the rhetorical questions and the, the, uh, the response to it. He says, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts? To you priests, right, he's telling us, who despise my name. So we see this, core, this, this parallel, right? God is saying, you despise my name. And they're going, what have we done? Are you kidding me? We haven't done this. Yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? And, and it goes on. Here's the accusation. Here's the answer, right? You offer defiled food on my altar. But say, in what way have we defiled you? By saying the table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice... Right? Is it not evil? He's referencing the Old Testament. You know better, right? Is this not evil? It's an evil act. And when you offer the lame, the sick, is it not evil? Offer it to your governor. Isn't that interesting? Right? Would your own government accept this? Right? Your governor? Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? So here we see, at the beginning, we see this um, really accusation, right? son, they understand this, we understand this. If a son honors his father, a servant, his master, we would get that. We would say, yeah, absolutely, this should be happening. It should be happening in life. Well, and quickly, right, uh, Micah kind of turns it, excuse me, Malachi, I'm going to say Micah a few times. I might, that might happen. Know that I mean Malachi throughout this, okay? Um, Malachi says, look, it's, it's the idea of, of honor, and we understand that. Right? Honor is attached to this idea of a weighty reference. When you honor someone, it's to give what is, what is proper, what is due. A son should honor, right, his father, a servant, his master. That's, we would expect that. And yet Malachi is going to turn this whole thing around and say this is all about your lack, right, your lack of honor to the Lord. He poses that with some rhetorical questions, right? God is saying, if I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence, right? It says Yahweh, right, the Lord of hosts, to the priests who despise my name. So the, the accusation is quite clear, right? Because they have come in this way, God is, is not being honored, right? There's no honor for, for God. Their worship is unacceptable. I mean, that's the, the gravity of it. Here you have the priests of the nation who are going through the motions, and God is saying, you're not even close, right? None of it is honoring to me. So here's a question that we hopefully is running around in your mind. Is it possible to be in attendance in a worship service and yet despise the Lord? Well, that has some weight to it, doesn't it? 
Sometimes we feel that. Now we're talking about, uh, you know, potentially coming and missing the, the, the point. I know, I understand we have bad days. I get that. I understand that, that sometimes our focus isn't where it should be. But this should wake us up, right, to being a church, right? What are they doing? They are not revering his name. They are not honoring his name. God is saying none of this is acceptable. I don't accept your worship. Can we imagine that if, that if you know, God was here and saying, no, try it again, right? Nope, you're not there yet. This is why it's important that we come and revere his name. And God explains that, doesn't he? He unfolds it in the first five verses. He's saying, I am God, or I am the, I am the sovereign God. I am the, the God who of, of justice I love, right? And justice is attached to his love. And yet he is faithful, and he uses his name. He is, right, the Lord of hosts. He is Yahweh. In the New Testament, it's Jehovah. He's saying, I am, I am the self-existent God. And he says it, I believe, in these 14 verses some 16 times. Right? He says that name. He has a few different other names, Adonai and El. All of these come out in, this, in the context of this. He's saying, this is who I am. And you, when you come and you worship, you fail to understand who I am. We despise, he says. We despise his name. That's what he says to the priest. You despise it. It's not that you just accept it or you just come and worship, but that you despise it. And it's interesting, if you look up the word despise, right, it is to show contempt for, right, or think lightly. Um, it's to view an object regarded as bad or of little value. And yet God over and over and over again says, Yahweh, I am the self-existent and eternal God. I am El, He is the Almighty God. I'm Adonai, the Lord, that's the name used in prayer. All these names are in these first 14 verses. So we see the accusation. It's pretty serious. And then it's explained for us, isn't it? He comes and says, well, how are we doing this? And he goes to verse 7. He says, this is what you're doing. You're coming and, and you're offering defiled food on my altar. But once again, we'd ask the question, how have we defiled you? Well, it's interesting, right? There's requirements of the law that they fail to understand when God wants to be worshipped. I think he's the one who has the right to tell us how we should do it, right? But yet so often we kind of go and say, well, this is how I think it should be done, and therefore we do what we think is best. And this is the, the pattern that is happening. And they're thinking in this, in this moment, right, that they're coming and they're fulfilling, that God is actually pleased, and yet their heart is far from this. Their lips are praising him. Their heart is far from it. And we think about it, and they're going to come, they're going to offer their gift. And so first we have to realize our gift of worship, the lifting of our voices and praising God, our time of prayer, right, our time of reading of God's word, is it's first offered to God, isn't it? We think about coming with a gift. If you have a friend, if we're in this, this idea that a father to his son or a son to a father and a servant to a master, would you come and give someone that is close to you some type of used item or gift or something that's been worn out and say, hey, here you go. No, we wouldn't do that, right? And God is saying, this is what you're doing with your worship. It's the leftovers. I don't know if, you've, if you clean dishes in your house. I do that from time to time, and there's, it's kind of amazing what the dog ends up scoring, right? The end of the, of the mill, you're like, wow, but you scrape that off the plate. And you know, sometimes that's kind of like our worship. Yeah, this is what's left this week. And I don't mean to be harsh or to be, to be uh, you know, cruel in any way. It's to wake us up and snap us. God is using some very stern language with them. I mean, the prophecy comes out of here. This is going to go to the nations. This is the last book of the Old Testament. It ends with the word a curse, right? It's a curse. And yet it's looking forward to the cross. And we are a church today that, that is post-cross, right? We have Christ. We have every reason to come. I understand there's difficulties in life. I get we go through hard times. I get there's moments like Joseph's story, right, where there's pits and there's prison and there's brokenness and there's anguish and there's tears. I understand that. Right? This is why there's an object. Right? God is the object of our worship because of him, because of Christ, because in the middle of brokenness, I can lift my voice in my life because I know not only is God sovereign over the situation I'm in, he is the ever-present God who is with me in the middle of the situation. He never leaves and never forsakes that he would cease to be God. So it's important. Our, our gift first comes, right, to God. Second part of this, the thing that's important to understand is there's a theological component to this, right? God is setting up the whole idea of the cross and the cross coming. The animals were supposed to be without blemish, right, because of the sacrifice. It was a sacrifice for an atonement. So it had to be a perfect animal, right? The animal represented God's provision for their sins, 
They would transfer, in essence, their sins to the perfect lamb, right? The animal. And therefore, the animal would be sacrificed. And it was the cleansing. Now, think about it. What is God setting up for us? Could Christ die on a cross if he had sins, if he was blemished? He cannot, right? He who knew no sin, he became sin for us, for you, right? We see the, motiv- the motivation here, right? Like how much God loves us cannot be defiled. And yet here's what they're doing. The sanctuary in, the, in this, this moment of Malachi is to be holy. The altar is to be holy. The sacrifices are to be holy. And yet they go on. This is, none of this is happening. And yet here's their question. How have we defiled it? Right? Talk about just missing it altogether. How have, we defiled, how have I? I mean, you see the pride, right? I showed up. I sacrificed the animal. We burned it on the altar. What, what is your problem? Right? You can see the, kind of the, the, the arrogance floating out of these priests, and you wonder why the nation was struggling. Right? How important it is for the church right, to come, to give our worship. Because the people brought defiled gifts, they did not think that the altar and the ritual was worthwhile. It says in verse 8, And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? When you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? So here you have the reason, right? They come and we're to sacrifice the animals. And yet you can see they're thinking a little bit, right? We know, hey, I could, this, this animal, I, it's not good for anything else. I know i got to go take one and, and for the sacrifice, let's bring the animal in. And, and you know what? Animals can be expensive. And I know there's at least three per family. This kind of has to happen. And you know what? These other ones I couldn't sell. Let's just use them. Right? It's win-win. It's kind of their thinking. Right? Let's just use the bad animals. It's going to get burned up anyway. Right? God doesn't really matter. Right? You see their thinking. And you see God's, the weight of his rebuke. Is it not evil? Man, that's, that's kind of tough, isn't it? Is it not evil? And he says, look, would you take this? Would your government accept this as payment for anything? We understand that right away, right? The government gets their hands, they're part of, the, of your paycheck before you even touch it, right? Before it comes to you, they've already gotten some. They're like pre-check thing. They're just, that's wonderful. But would the government accept this? That's what he's saying. Would you take it to your government? Would he find it, would it find it favorably for you? Of course, the answer is rhetorical. No, it wouldn't. It wouldn't. So their laugh, right, in essence, kind of speaks us a little bit. Of course, they're not, but they should be. Yet we think in our worship, you know, is this enough? Is, did, did my worship this morning meet my standard? You know, I heard a pastor one time say that if the Spirit of God left the church, would the church know it? I thought that's interesting because, you know, in this, in this, uh, uh, in this chapter, in, ses- in essence, if God had left Israel, I don't think Israel would have known it, right? The glory has departed, right? Ichabod, the whole idea, and it's like they don't even know it. We're going, and they're just, why? What are you, why, are you, why are you jamming us up on this? We've been doing this. I think there's a huge lesson for the church. Man, a huge lesson for us. We must come and revere his name. We must understand that he is the self-existent one. He is eternal. He is God, right? He is the one who is sovereign. He is him. And God expects our best. Reminds me of the little boy who went to church one morning and he enjoyed it. And when he got home, he had prayed, dear God, we had a good time at church today, but I wish you were there. And so often we might be like that. The church may be like that. So we have to come back and, and, and evaluate. We must revere his name. This leads to my, my second point, verses 9 through 11, when we come and God expects this, right? I think for a New Testament church, we should be revering his name. And the second one, I said we, we do this when we seek his favor, right? We come to seek his favor. This is verses 9 through 11. He says, but now entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us, while this is being done by your hands, will he accept you favorably? Says the Lord of hosts. Who is there even among you who would shut the doors so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hands for, for excuse me, from the rising of the sun even to its going down. My name shall be great among the Gentiles, and every place incense shall be offered by my, excuse me, to my name. And a pure offering, for my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. And here he's continuing, really, in essence, the, the charge against the priests. 
right? Malachi, a little bit, maybe of some sarcasm here, is saying, you know what, you should be doing this. Your, your job is to be seeking the face of God and treating God, right? That's what he means. You should be seeking the face of God on behalf of the nation. You know, you should go and do this. And he's thinking that even though you're doing it and attempting to do that now, God is not listening, right? You're not, you're not in essence, seeking God's favor. Isn't that a great motive? Shouldn't that be a great motive in our life? You're seeking God's favor. If I live my life in a way that is honoring how do I honor the Lord? How do I seek his favor and the things that I do and then what I give my attention to? How important is that? And of course, the answer here we would say as a, as a church, you've heard me say many times, if there's sin, we should repent, right? This is, this is the call. Entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us, right? As the priests were unable to do this, you and I can be. We should seek God's favor. We should come seek this self-existent God, right? He is the one who is mentioned here. It's the name he is choosing to use, revealing himself. I am the eternal God. We should seek him while we can find him. We know that he loves us. We know that he's sovereign. We know that he's just. We know that he's faithful. We also know that his grace is amazing, right? We see it in the cross. And I think this is an urgent call really to, to, the, to pastors, to leaders, elders, an urgent call to, to those in leadership to come, right, to understand what this is about. Sunday mornings, we come to church, we should open his word, we should have a hunger for his word as a church, and we should be expounded. I think there is a responsibility on pastors to do that, and I think there's a responsibility on congregations to expect that. Too much in, in our church in America is has slid by because we said, well, that's, that's good enough, right? The standard has been lowered, and I think we should keep it where it needs to be. Is that true? Is it true to God's word? I mean, God says some very hard things here. He says, look, you're going through the motions. Not only is it, is it pointless, but he says in verse 10, who is there even among you who would shut the doors so that you would not kindle a fire on my altar in vain? In essence, God is saying, you know, it's better if you would just close the doors down, scatter the church. That's better than what you're currently doing. Chew on that for a moment, right? And the accusation is that pastors, pastors, what are you doing, right? Well, we were, we're just kind of doing it our way. This is what I think it should be, right? Is it, is it scripture driven? Too often we kind of love God on our own terms. You know, a little while back, we, we got a dog from, from Micah and Brittany Eck uh, named Lucy. She's a good dog, right? She really is. I, I tease our life group, like, if anyone wants to take her home, you can, you know. She's, you know, she's available for purchase, you know. Uh, <laughs> But I love, I love our dog, and, and, but one thing when Brittany dropped her, dropped her off, she said, you know, she's a diva. And I thought, that's really interesting to describe a dog. And I figured out what she meant, right? And, and Lucy's the type of dog that, that enjoys being loved, right? She wants to pet her, but it's, it's on her terms, right? I mean, it clearly is. She'll come over, step by you, pet with you, and she'll leave. Okay, I'm done. Leave me alone, right? And it just kind of has it like, she really is a diva. I, you know, sometimes you want to pet her, and you're like, I don't know, is it okay? You almost want to ask permission, right? Can I, can I pet you? Is it okay? It's just that way, but sometimes, like, with, with our walk, you, you watch this and go, how often are we, you know, God, I'll love you, but it's, it's on my terms, right? When I'm ready, I'll come. And we kind of put God as, as the one who who's has to be the standoffish one, right? And is not God the Father? Is not God the Master? Is not God the Self? Is it not God all this? And yet, where he's saying, where is my honor? He goes on in verse 10 and says, I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hands. We don't seek God's favor in our worship, right? Then our worship would be worthless, pointless, a waste of time. In essence, that's what he's saying. You're just going through the motions. We must engage our minds, right? True religious affections is knowing the God of Scripture, that when we come, we worship the true living God and not something else. So God takes no pleasure in worthless worship. In essence, he rejects it. And so what happens because of this? Well, he turns to the Gentiles, right? Which is good for us, right? In one sense, we're like, well, I'm glad this is happening. The cross is coming. Christ is going to be born. But I think it's important for us to understand that, that in our worship, it should be, it should be weighty, 
right? The idea of honor should come. There should be meaning behind it. We should sing truth. We should preach truth. We should have a desire for that, right? We should come with these things. And again, I say this is such a, an important lesson for the church today. I remember having a meeting with a, a couple, my wife and I, it was a while back, and they were attending uh, a church, and they were just kind of struggling through, and they were sharing with me and some of the things that were happening. And as he got done sharing, I, my, my first response, only words I could say was, you know, shame on your pastors and shame on your elders. I said, you, do, you deserve more. There should be more. We should come and hear God's word. There should be a desire for that. There should be a desire from your pastors to do those kind of things. And as the couple had shared kind of their, um, their reasons for what they had done and they're reaching out and they're trying to, you know, to engage, and I just thought, man, they should be listening. They should be listening. You know, I realized that, that, you know, pastors, elders, people, we're not perfect, right? There should be a desire and a passion for God's Word. And I think we should take as, as pastors and elders seriously when Paul says, you know, come follow me as I follow Christ. And if the pastor or elders are not doing that, we should not follow them. And that's the responsibility of the church, right? They're not following Christ. They're not teaching the Word. Man, you have a responsibility to speak to that. Because we see in this passage what is happening, right? God is saying it would be better. It would be better if you shut the doors and disbanded. That's a pretty amazing statement. He says, I will not accept your, your worship. It's not favorable to me. So that's a real quick, right, moment in our heart. What is God saying to us? We're a New Testament church, right? We know that Christ has some serious charges to the churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, and he says, if you don't change, right, you're neither the Ephesus, lukewarm or hot, right, I'm going to come and take your lampstand, right, the same charges here, right, he's going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to, my name will be glorified in the nations, I'm going to include the Gentiles, which is wonderful, Romans chapter 11, we're grafted in, this is a, a wonderful, great thing, Christ is coming, and yet we know as a New Testament church, God can take his lampstand, can't he, and give it to another, God is serious about this. So we need to revere, right, his name. We need to seek his favor. And this leads to my last, and it's probably one we probably don't want to hear, maybe. We do this giving our best when we heed his rebuke. It says in verses 12 through 14, it says, But you profane it, in that you say, The table of the Lord is defiled, and its fruits, its food is contemptible. You also say, oh, what a weariness, and you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick. Thus you bring an offering. Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord? But cursed be the deceiver who has in his flock a mel and takes a vow, but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. They have turned their worship into really a, a nuisance, right? This is something we have to go through. It's a worrisome. And it goes on beyond that. And they actually say this is, uh, they're sneering at it. They're not even hiding their emotions. This is how we genuinely feel about this. This is what's happening in the passage. We sneer at what the Lord wants. We don't follow after this. It's not seeking the scriptures and going, this is what we should do. Ah, it's just kind of what we, we do on Sunday. Right? How often do we say, you know, Christianity is not what you do on Sunday. It's who you are every day of the week, right? It's not what I put on my Christian jacket and come to church. No, every day of the week, it's who you are, right? Christ has changed. The old is gone. The new has come. And yet here you have them sneering, not even hiding their emotions in regards to these things, sneering at this action. And their worship really has been turned into a, um, a religion of routine. So may it not be said of us, may it not, you know, of us as a church not come and, and try to deceive the Lord. And again, I'm not talking about being perfect, right? We're in process. Understand there's, there's hard days and there's difficult days, and I get that. But I think even in those moments through brokenness, when we praise and worship God, there's something wonderful because we know and we're reminded 
the sovereign God, right, who's in control. And I think at times, if we're serious with his word, we should come. We should heed the rebuke. Rebuke is good. Repentance is good. Calling sin, sin is good for us. We may not want to hear that, right? But man, sometimes we need to hear that. I repent and heed God's correction. You know, in closing, I, I thought of some things. Is, is, you know, I thought about kind of some application points, but really I called it closing questions. There are things for you to, to, to think on. They're not for you to necessarily share. Of course you can, but I kind of set these questions uh, in front of you just as, as um, you know, inventory for you and the Lord and your devotion time where you can ask, ask God what's happening here. And my first question I put on the end of your notes here is, is your worship to God your best? Is it your best across the board? Is, it, is your time the best? I know we, could, we all would probably answer that, yeah, probably no, right? Times maybe it's good. But, but, you know, an easy way to figure that out is if somebody like, you know, if, if uh, Chuck Swindoll came in and stood next to you during worship, would it change the way you sang? Right? Now, I don't want to say, I, I think you guys sing great. I sit up here and hear all your voices. It's wonderful. I'm not saying anything like that. But would it change if something like that happened? Right? Does God have your best? Again, it's for you and the Lord. The second question is, are you playing church or being the church? Right? Are you just... Um, are you enjoying the programs? Are you coming to the ministries, but you lose sight of why we're doing this, right? And so that's why I always talk about, you know, we shouldn't play church. So many people do that. We should be the church. That means following God's word. That means at times when I don't want to hear this, we should hear this, and we should heed his rebuke because that's what's good for me because he is the potter and I'm the clay, and he's this awesome God who's refining you. And at times I think of the Lord, right? He's just taking that bowl and he's making you for noble purposes. And sometimes when he takes that clay, it's like he digs his thumb into your life a little bit and you're thinking, oh, Lord, right? Let up on this one, right? But he's got a plan, right? Realize that he has a plan. He's a purpose. He loves you. So we should not be playing church. We should be the church. It glorifies the Lord. My third question is, is your Christian service a religion of routine? Have you lost sight of it? The priests clearly have lost sight of it, right? They were bored with worship. Going, it's a, it's a nuisance, right? I mean, we have to do this. We'll defile the table, right? We'll take the offering. We'll just go and do whatever we want with it. It should not be said of us. If our time of devotion or serving the Lord, if it's, if it's becoming bored or if it's you know, lacking something, maybe you're, you're in a place where it's just kind of routine. You need to do something to, to, to knock yourself out of that and remember why you're doing this, Right? I can do my devotion time because I want to spend time with the Lord. I don't want to make sure I read X number of pages or X number of whatever my devotion might be. I want to engage the living God in my devotion time. I want to commune with Him. Then my last question here is, do you have a passion to promote God's glory among the nations? Right? God says, if, if then I am the Father, which we would say, yeah. And He says, where is my honor? If I am the Master, to which we would say, yes, you are. Where is my reverence? See, God expects my, your best. He does. But it's not that he's a God who sets up there and says, you better bring your best or I'm not going to listen. No, he's a gracious, benevolent, loving, gracious God, right? And I use grace twice there. Because he is. And he wants us to come and out of brokenness and out of the, the valleys and the mountaintops. He wants you to come. He wants you to, to worship. He wants you to, to say, you know what? You are the self-existent God. You are the God who has saved me by sending your son. You are the one who has the authority and the right to say all of these things of Scripture. And, and Lord, help me to hear, to heed, to listen. Help me to favor, Lord, you, right? Favor your, what, what honors you. Help me to live this way. Let me revere your name because you are God. You know, when I was, I was, uh, I don't know how old I was, but I remember growing up in church and there was a song, right? I think it was Give Thanks. Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart, right? And I remember singing the song and I would change the words to that as I sang it, right? Because he's given Jesus Christ, right? And it's a great song. There's nothing wrong with this song. But it bothered me that that's the only reason we were worshiping God is because of what he gave I remember singing it and adding to the song going, Lord, I, I worship you and give thanks just simply for who you are. And if you never saved me, man, you're still worthy. You're this mighty, awesome God. I would love to say I had deep theological thoughts on that, but that was the extent of it. I remember just, just changing it. 
church I grew up in was big, and so I would, could sing it out loud. No one could hear me, you know. A lot of people singing, but I, I was just, Lord. And of course, I would, I would add as well, because you've given, yes, how much more? Lord, for who you are, you are worthy, and yet you've given your son. This doesn't make any sense to me. You put my, all my sin on, on, on Jesus, and you, you yourself would, would take that wrath that is due me and place it on him. And then yet you would send your spirit to call me. I don't, Lord, I, this is un, un, the gospel is amazing. God's love is, is unbelievable. He reveals himself and going, I, I am God, I, I've loved you. Past tense, I love you. Present tense, I love you. Future tense, this is who he is. He doesn't change because we go through difficulty. He is constant. And yet it's easy for us, isn't it, to get, get kind of into emotions. We just kind of go through the motions and we lose sight of the fact when we come as a church and we lift our voices in our lives, we are worshiping the true living God who spoke and the world came into existence. And this world that he spoke and created is a footstool, right? Get, get a picture. He's mighty. He's infinite. And yet, what does he do? He saves us. He sends his son to die on a cross, and then that's not, not enough for him. I will walk with you daily. I will make provision for you. I will provide for you. I will protect you. I will be your, I will lead you. Right? And that's not enough, even that. It's still not enough. I'm going to give you an eternity. I'm going to give you salvation. And we stop, and yet sometimes our worship is, we lose sight of just this, the magnitude of this awesome, incredible God, right? Who has revealed himself to us in his word, and yet he's so much more. We can't exhaustively know him, and yet what we know, we still can't fully comprehend, right? We get this and go, man, he's so much more. Doesn't that begin to change our worship? Because God is saying, I am the self-existent one. Why are you going through the motions? We've lost sight of it. And church, it's easy for us to get there. I know your, your schedules are busy. I know we go through things. I know there's times where we ask the why. God doesn't necessarily, he doesn't owe us the why. Why, why do we go through this? He doesn't owe us that. We can ask it all you want. He may give it to you. But I think if you change the questions, God, help me to know that even in this, you're sovereign. Help me to know even in this, you have loved me. Help me to know that even in the middle of this, you are loving me. Help me to know that, that when all this goes away and this world is no more, you still love me because you are God. So don't let our worship slide into something that is just the religion of routine. Let it be full of joy. We should lift our voices and sing out loud. Lift our lives to him and glorify him. I realize we go through difficult. I get that. But it should not be a general thing. It should not be the norm. Your pastor should not be that way. Your elders should not be that way. The congregate, the church should not be that way. So we heed this rebuke. We listen to God's word and say, Lord, help us to follow because you are a great God. You're worthy of our praise. Let me pray. Father, we are very grateful and thankful for the truth of your word. And maybe this passage this morning for many of us might have been difficult to hear. I know I feel the conviction myself, God. And yet with the same breath, Lord, in the same sentence, I can say thank you for your word this morning. For it is our desire, and I do not question the desire, Lord, of your church to glorify you to lift you high. I know each of us are going through different things and there's different seasons of life and there's different situations of life and there's cares and, and difficulties and joys and all these things, yet you are constant. And so I ask, Lord, for, for all of us this morning where maybe um, our worship has become just a routine. Maybe we've even sneered at it a little bit in our spirits. God, forgive us. Forgive us our sins. And help us, Lord, by your Spirit to think about who you are. That you are God. All things are possible with you. And we live in this world, Lord, and, and, and yet we see the brokenness and we see, Lord, the lives that are hurting. And, and we're, we're left with that, that moment where we say, Lord, why? And yet you are sovereign. Lord, you do not owe us that. But we know in the middle of difficulty, you are with us. You have a plan, you have a purpose, Lord. You did not speak and create this world for nothing. 
You sent your Son, Lord. There is powerful, so powerfully demonstrated your love in the cross. And each of us who know Lord Jesus as our Savior, we say thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for knowing our names. Thank you for knowing the struggle and the conflict. Thank you for knowing the, the deep uh, uh, problems and the, and the stresses and the struggles that we are facing or even thinking through even this morning. Lord, you know those things. And I believe it is your desire that we would come and we would repent if it's sin and we would just simply trust and believe you are God. Help us to get there. Help us to revere your name in every area of our life, regardless of what we're doing at work or at home, in the family, everything. Lord, help us to revere your name. Help us to seek, God, your favor, that we live lives that are honoring to you and glorifying you, whether we eat or drink or all that we do, we do it all for your glory. Help us to be mindful of that because our, our schedules are busy and life is at times just takes our thoughts off that. So Lord, help us to think, to renew our minds, as Paul tells us. And when moments come, Lord, where you rebuke, we know it is done in love. It is done because you love us. You discipline those whom you love. And so Lord, let us hear it that way and in humility come and confess and acknowledge you. And help us to grow in our understanding just how awesome, how awesome you are. I love the song, Lord, we, we read, how awesome you are. It is the right word, and yet it's, it needs to be so much bigger. So, Lord, thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this word. Encourage us with it. Grow us, Lord, with it. Make us to, to grow with a stronger resolve and confidence that we serve the one true living God. You are mighty. You are awesome. Thank you for Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Thank you for the spirit that dwells in us and seals us for the day of redemption. Lord, thank you. Turn our attention, Lord, our eyes to you. Let us praise you with all that we are because of you. And we pray this in the awesome and wonderful, precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.